This podcast is part of the Shareable Podcast Network. Learn more at shareable.fm. This podcast is Shareable. I'm your host, Jeff Gibbard, commonly known as the world's most handsome strategist and professional speaker. I'm also a superhero. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single Shareable episode. And that's it. That's the intro. Short and sweet. Let's get to the show. Welcome back to Shareable. Today, my guest, uh, let, me, let me introduce him the way that it's proper to introduce him, which is how many people can say they have never worked for anyone else? Selling eggs door to door at 14 years old began a lifetime of self-employment for my guest today. As a speaker and small business consultant, Jeffrey Shaw helps self-employed and small business owners gain control of their business in what seems like otherwise uncontrollable circumstances. He's drawing on his experience as a renowned portrait photographer. Jeffrey join, uh, shows business owners how to see business through a different lens and strategies to compose the often chaotic pieces of life and businesses into sustainable success. Jeffrey's TEDx Lincoln Square Talk is featured on TED.com because he's freaking fantastic. And he's the host of the top-rated podcast, The Self-Employed Life, which if you are self-employed, I would strongly advise that you subscribe to. And he's also the author of The Self-Employed Life, Business and Personal Development Strategies that Create Sustainable Success, which is due out very soon at the publishing of this episode, and Lingo, which you have probably heard me talk about before, and Jeffrey was a previous guest uh, when he was doing his book tour for Lingo. Lingo is how to discover your ideal customer's secret language and make your business irresistible. I am proud to welcome back a friend of mine, an amazing person that I look up to and love so very much. Jeffrey Shaw, welcome back to Shareable. Hey, fellow Jeff. It's awesome to be here with you as well. You know, I have to comment on something. I think I haven't gotten used to hearing people say how my TEDx talk went to the TED.com website. I got to tell you a funny story about that. I think a lot of people will appreciate. I had kind of forgotten about this. So I found out about it through somebody else. I was at my mom's house. Now, to, to put this into perspective, you have to understand where I grew up, selling eggs at age 14. My mom still lives in the same house, which is in the middle of the country, a couple hours in New York or north of New York City. And I grew up pretty lower middle class. So it's a simple home, to say the least. So I was visiting her when somebody messaged me to say, hey, do you know that your TEDx talk is on TED.com? And it was one of those moments I think a lot of us can appreciate where here I felt like I felt like the jam in that moment while I'm sitting in this tiny little kind of pitiful ranch house that is my childhood. And I just I, and for whatever reason, hearing you say that just brought that whole thing back. It's like, that's the coolest thing about this thing we do in business, right? Like, you know, in one minute we can think we're, we're, we're all that. And, and it's also where we came from. So I, that just really struck me. I, I have oh, not I shared that story. And it just struck when you hearing you say it reminded me. Yeah, of it. it like it makes me feel like so your book is the self employed life. It makes me think like the self actualized life, right? Like you come yeah. from somewhere and you decide who you want to be. And then you do things you win, you lose, you succeed, you fail. And then maybe something like this happens to you where you get to be sitting in your humble beginnings and hear this like incredible news. It makes me think of, you know, our mutual friend, uh, Phil Jones. I went to his, uh, he did a thing in New York where he was, um, uh, doing like a, a recording for audible. Yeah. And I was and there. I didn't know you were there. Were you at that? <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I didn't know you were like, shoot. I'm, we didn't I'm connect. Awesome. That's yeah. so weird. Um, there wasn't even that big too. So we must've just like <laughs> literally walked past each other. So, so anywho, when he was at that, you remember the part at the end where he's telling his story and like, he started to get choked up when, when yeah. Drew had asked him about like, you know, do you ever think you're going to be here this and that? And he was like, I'm just like a dumb kid from wherever he said it was. And he just started getting like choked up. Like he wanted to be on stage. He never thought it would happen. And it did. I think those moments are like so incredibly profound and, and I hope to have one of those one day. Uh, oh, you're I, living well, it. You're yeah. living it, but it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's like I said, it's both a good reminder. It keeps us grounded, and it's also an acknowledgement of what we can become. You know, I, mean, I think that's that's the positive side of it for sure. Awesome. Well, you are someone who is frequently on my mind as I'm uh, talking to clients and as I'm doing coaching and things like that because I, I, you know, I know you have a new book that's out to be released, but your book Lingo continues to be, I think, a you know, a hallmark. Um, contribution to the conversation around brand communication um, and specifically about learning how to speak directly to the people that, that you want to be doing business with. So, you know, now uh, I'm working for an agency um, called soul marketing down in Austin. And, you know, we do a lot of work with brand and for me, lingo is something that comes up in my head a lot. I think a lot about 
the stories you've told in that book about, you know, your background as a professional photographer and the things that you did and the stores that you visited to get into the mindset and to understand the people that you work with. Um, so you're, you're someone who's routinely on my mind. And when I saw you, um, you know, you, you started posting some, some previews of this move towards talking about the self-employed life, you know, which had been your brand to me for such a long time. Like that's who you are in my mind is like this, this person who just can work for themselves and just gets it. And like, ever since I met you, I was, I was kind of in awe of some of the things. So it made sense. I immediately felt like, oh, that's, that's his lingo. So let me ask you this, because this is where my mind went with it immediately. Did you move to the self-employed life as the next step after lingo? Because you felt it was the next logical step in terms of the progression of what you could teach people or because you already know that you have that lingo locked in cold. Like it's who you are deep in your soul. So like, it doesn't even take, like, because lingo could be applicable to like enormous companies. It could be for like all sorts of things, but you chose to kind of take that in the next direction of the self-employed life. Can you kind of elaborate on, on how that journey went? Yeah. I, I actually don't think it's the logical move, which, which introduced some challenges. I actually was writing, to be honest with you, I was writing the next logical book um, as a follow-up to lingo, which was suggested to me that it be a deeper dive into, you know, as it was described to me, lingo was sort of the concept book. It introduced the idea of brand messaging and connecting to your ideal customers that, and once the book was out there, I, I learned some really valuable lessons. And one of those things I, what I found I, I was most working on was helping people with their brand messaging on the homepage of their website and, and the importance of that right? Like you have seconds to get somebody's attention. It all comes down to the homepage and, and realizing how hesitant typical users are today because we're all on mobile devices. Like we don't like to go to interior pages. So from a brand messaging perspective, it, the homepage of websites became incredibly important. So I actually was writing a book that was going to be called First Page Impressions. Uh, so it was actually a first impressions. It's a good title. I probably just gave it to somebody else to steal, but that's okay. I don't think I'm going to read the book. I don't think I'm going to write the book, but it, it, the idea was it was a very tactical move to follow up on a concept book. And I was halfway through the book and, and it, to be honest with you, Jeff, because it was a logical choice, which is not how I've lived my life. I, I tend to live my life from my heart, my instinct and what feels right to me. I just didn't feel great about the book. And I wound up pushing myself to give a keynote at an event January of 2020, uh, an event I've spoken at many times, and I pushed myself to give a different style keynote because I felt like I had already given them so much of what they expect of me. And it was a stretch. Can't say it was my most successful talk, um, but I walked off the stage realizing I had, I had stepped into who I truly am at levels that I hadn't in years, that I felt like I was my most authentic self. I, uh, it was the type of talk, as I know you can relate to as a speaker yourself, that the content was, I, I did no practicing, was intentional. I didn't practice my moves on the stage, right? I knew the content and I knew when it delivered it. I just had no, so it all came from raw motion. And to me, it was a palatable difference to the typically very rehearsed speaker that I typically am. Um, and so that just freed me. I walked away from that experience feeling like um, that I had really nailed a different, a, a different talk so I got on the plane, actually messaged my editor and said, I'm writing the wrong book uh, that I'd like to change. And I wound up taking the concepts of that kind of experimental keynote. And, and in doing that, I realized who I care most about. In the world. I thought I was always for entrepreneurs. That's what I've been talking about all along. And I realized it's a segment, a seg segment of entrepreneurship. It's self-employed business owners. I'm not even sure what entrepreneur means anymore, mm -hmm. right? To some people, it means, oh, so you're in between jobs. Like, I'm not even sure what entrepreneur means, but self-employed to me just has such a, a connotation of you, who, who you are, how you live, your business model. It says it all. And, and the irony is, is you look, as it often happens for us, you look back in your life and realize, why did this take so long for me to figure out? Like you said, it was obvious to you. Yeah. Why this takes so long for me to figure out? Because I've been self-employed my whole life, which is why I tell that story about selling eggs at 14 years old. Like it was, it's the most obvious thing now, but it just was a little bit of a journey to get that level of, of clarity. Yeah. I love that. It's like, you kind of said, it's got it all there. Like it's very literal and, and you're right about the word entrepreneur. I immediately conjure up several things. Like, are you in your series a or series B? Like, you know, are you just somebody with like a silly idea that like you want to try and scale it? And this, like, you're one of those, like chasing the Zuckerberg fantasy. Um, or, you know, are you someone that's just actually a small business owner or like, there's so many different ways that that word 
gets co-opted by different people for their own purposes. And I think self-employed life is so very accurate. And actually, you know, you were such a vital part of my kind of six months off of discovery, like my, my sabbatical, I guess I would call it. And, um, and when you came out with self-employed life, I was like, oh, this makes so much sense why you were so critical in that. Because what I discovered in that six months off after talking to you and several others was like, what I really wanted was, it was always just to work for myself. It was to yeah. be the person who creates his own destiny, um, doesn't have to like answer to someone like you, you figure out your own thing. And, and what I realized is I also didn't want employees. I wanted to be a solo. And again, you were someone who I thought about through that because you've so effectively been able to build a career as, as, you know, as a portrait photographer, that's just you against the world, right? Like you mm -hmm. may have had other people that you brought in, but that was you against the world. And I realized that that so aligns with what I really wanted and the freedom of it and all of that. So um, I appreciate that you put all that together in terms of what you're trying to do here. I, I, you have the book, you have the podcast, you have a community, which I just requested to join. Please approve me. Um, <laughs> it looks like a movement to me. It looks like a thing about bringing together people who align behind this idea of being self-employed, that it's part of their identity. It's part of their DNA. They literally can't do anything else. I literally can't do anything else. So what is the, what's the end goal mm -hmm. here? What are you trying to do with this? Because I'm excited to be along for that ride. And I hope the people listening who, who even the title self-employed life, that that sticks out to them. I want to know where we're going. So I, and I literally started a grassroots advocacy group. So it is a, it is a movement and it's a, it's a mission for me that, that becomes a movement. And um, so the advocacy group is voices of the self-employed.com. Right. So anybody can, well, I just need emails. Right. And it's a very, that's all we're doing. We're just collecting emails at this point um, because it is, a, I want to, I want self-employed business owners to be seen. Uh, I had just started the book. Like I said, I had adapted the concepts of the talk into the book. And I just started when the pandemic hit. And the moment that there was any concern of the economic impact of this, the, every hair of my body stood up in fear for what was going to happen to self-employed business owners. Uh, because I've been in business 35 years. I've been through this cycle numerous times. I was going to be fine, but I was so used to being overlooked as a self-employed business owner because we have fallen in the past, fallen into this pool of being considered a, too small to be a small business. Because small business is up to 500 employees. And often, hey, you know, any government funding that's available, you have to have a minimum of 10 employees or 20 employees. And it leaves us out. I've never gotten an ounce of help in my life from any other source, right? I mean, the, when I have my lowest moments, the one thing that picks me up is I realize every dollar I've ever made has slipped through my fingers. I never got a paycheck from anybody. I've never gotten any government help, no, you know, nothing. And yeah, I fought for bank loans when I was starting out because nobody wants to lend, you know, a hobbyist uh, turned professional money. So, but what I found out because I pretty well connected to some people in DC is, I found out that the PPP loan program was the first time in history, in US history, it's the first time uh, self-employed business owners were called out in a piece of legislation. And it gave me hope that we were going to be okay, but it also let me know that the, it wasn't done out of the kind of anybody's heart. It was in recognition of the economic impact that self-employed business owners have on our economy and that they needed to keep us in business. And as far as I was concerned, they cracked open a door and I'm never gonna let them close it. I am determined to keep that wide open. And, and truthfully, I want to end up in DC. I've always been politically activated. I was very involved in Connecticut state politics back in the day. And uh, I, I'm pretty loud mouthed when it comes to politics. And I hope to end up in DC as an advocate for self-employed business owners in one capacity or another. I will fight for legislation. I will fight for group health insurance for self-employed business owners. I will fight for retirement funds, whatever it takes. Um, but these are my people. And uh, so, yeah, I'm putting out a book that it very intentionally has the word life in it because I want people to have well-rounded, happy lives. Um, so I've always kind of built, I've always helped, I've always wanted to help people build their successful business because when people have success in their life, they can live more freely. So that's always good, my go-to. Let me, how can I make self-employed people be more financially successful, be more successful in their business? Because when we achieve that, then they live more freely and that's how we change the world. But behind the scenes, I will be doing what I can to change it as a movement. I love it. And you and I are so aligned in this and like the stuff I'm trying to do with the superhero Institute. Like I, I see, 
I'm like at the starting point and like you're, you're, you know, miles down the road on, and I'm going to keep studying what you're doing for this, but you know, it so resonates with me, everything you're saying. Cause I remember when I started my first business, my, well, that wasn't my first business, but my most, my, probably my first successful business. Um, I remember I had just gotten laid off. And then in that very beginning, because I hadn't been with the company long enough, I couldn't even get unemployment insurance. And in this one, I remember, you know, with the pandemic, when I saw that self-employed people, it actually occurred to me like, oh my God, wait, that's never actually, we've never actually been able to get anything. Yeah. And, and this whole idea of America as the land of opportunity and like the entrepreneurial dream, if you, if you take self-employed people out of that entrepreneurial dream, like what does that actually do to the narrative? Um, because I've always felt like the chips are stacked against us. You look at like self-employment taxes and you look at like all of the stuff that you have to go through and the hurdles as, as an individual working for yourself. It's like almost discouraging. Like they're trying to make you go and just get a job. Yeah, um, yeah. So I just, I love that you're so passionate about fighting for us and, and people like us. Um, I just think it's awesome. For those that are potentially not yet sure who they are, Maybe they're like, I got a job, but I don't like it. I've always wanted to do my own thing. Or maybe they had a lemonade stand when they were a kid. That's the happiest they've ever been. Or whatever it is, right? So we've got people that are like, maybe not sure of who they are. There's people like us who are like, I literally don't know any other way to be. There's people like my wife who she, I tried to get her to try her hand at starting her own thing. And she was like, I literally will never want to do because I hate it so much. Yeah. And she wants to have a job, right? So there are people who know who they are. There's people kind of in the middle. Let's talk a little bit about you know, you've done this for a while and you have a community of people that you speak to. Let's talk about some of the benefits and drawbacks of self-employed life yeah. as just a starting point. Why should someone do any of this? Aside from putting aside, of course, like the burning desire inside of you to do it and like problem with authority or whatever else you have like me. Um, yeah. what, what are some of the main reasons why someone might want to be self-employed? Yeah. Uh, you know, and come from so many sources. I mean, if I look at the root of why I'm self-employed and why I started selling eggs at 14 years old and just looked, I always knew I was going to have a life of, of self-employment because I actually just felt, I figured I was unemployable. I saw myself as really having no value to anybody else. Like I just figured I was so shy, so withdrawn, so out of the norm compared to everybody around me that I was like, well, pff, dude, this is on your shoulders. Like nobody's going to hire you. you know, I just, I had a you could say a pretty, a very low <laughs> sense of self-esteem. So to me, unemployment was like the only way to take care of my life. Like if I didn't do this on my own, no one else was going to take care of me. Can I pause you on that real quick? Yeah. I think what's interesting about that is, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that are not entrepreneurs and I have friends that are entrepreneurs and, and, and self-employed people. I would think people would assume the opposite that if you're going to go and sell eggs door to door, you have to have a very high opinion of yourself that you are going to be able to go door to door and sell eggs or whatever it is you're uh, going to start. I wanted to vomit. Like it was the scariest thing in the world. And I actually, Jeff, to be honest with you, I didn't realize until I was writing this book, like the question came up and they're like, why the hell did I do it? And then that brings the question, like, why, do, why, do, why do any of us put ourselves through what we do when we're self-employed? Because this is not the easy road. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's something is bigger than the fear. I was scared to death knocking on those doors and awkward. And I was 14 years old driving in my mother's Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, like this enormous boat of a car, but I lived in the country and I was, you know, I didn't have a driver's license, but nobody's going to stop you when you, know, you live in the country. And um, the whole thing was scary to me. I didn't know how to drive. I'm, I mean, I can't believe my mother let, let me use the car and I would drive from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, the whole thing was so, I mean, I literally wanted to vomit. It was so scary, but there were pieces of it that were bigger than my fear. That was a very personal experience. I never talked to anybody else about them, but the, the pieces that stood out to me was, I just found the whole thing, a massive puzzle that I found fascinating. I found it fascinating that you can, and I'll say it in a negative way, but I found it fascinating. You can convince people to follow your lead. You know, and one of the things I, I, I did as a strategy to looking back, it's, just, it's hysterical to me because I was 14. Like, uh, but I, I would go to a, what happened was I would go to a farm on Thursdays and I struck a deal with a local farmer that I would buy his eggs wholesale for 25 cents an egg. And then I would sell them for $1.25, um, 25 cents a dozen. And I would sell them for $1.25 a dozen. So you know, profitable. And um, which by the way, I Googled cost of eggs in 1978, it was 78 cents. So I was way above market. And, but I would go and a lot of these, they were from far fresh off the farm. So a lot of these eggs had chicken poop on them. And I actually developed this strategy of only cleaning off a certain amount of the poop. I would leave a certain amount of I mean, too much chicken poop is gross, but just enough indicated to the customer how farm fresh they were. Right. And there was an element to this. I'll explain. So this was the reason we lived there is my father was one of the first 90 employees at IBM. 
okay, which was a startup computer company in 1967. They bought up all this land in farm country because it was cheap. So most of the people that were brought there were early employees of IBM, usually brought from New York City or surrounding counties that were used to more urban living. And now we're living in the middle of nowhere where we share a phone number with seven other families. Okay. So most people were traumatized that they were no longer living in the city, but it was a good job. So there, there was, they were city people. So what's more, what's cooler than eggs with chicken poop on it? As far as like, oh my God, this is so farm fresh. I mean, I had one, I had one customer that was buying dozens and dozens of eggs for me. And I'm pretty sure she was going back to New York city in the weekends and reselling them. Right. Um, because they're farm fresh. So that became more fascinating to me than my fear how you could actually, the things you could do. And I still feel that way about business, honestly, Jeff, like what keeps me going all the time is it is a fascinating world to just to see why somebody would do it. Like I said, it's never the easy road. What we're seeing now, which really, really appeals to me, you know, right now in the U S there actually are two things are going on right now. We have the highest unemployment rate we've had since the great depression, which means we're going to have the biggest number of people becoming self-employed than we've ever had because there aren't enough jobs. When there aren't jobs, people are going to make their own way. Mm -hmm. And so we have that happening. There's another side I don't hear anybody else talking about. This pandemic and all the resulting circumstances, I believe has woken people up to wanting to live a life that makes them happy in ways that they never have before. People are making life's major lifestyle changes. We have a huge wave of people that are uncertain, as you say, they may be in a corporate job. They may be, they're just, they're okay with it. It's bringing in the paycheck, but they deeply desire more. They're purpose-driven, they're heart-centered. I think we're gonna have tons of those folks jumping ship and deciding that life is short. I actually devote a whole section of the book called uh, Midlife Self-Employment because I believe that there's a huge wave of 40 to 65-year-olds, men and women that are feeling like, this is good enough, but life isn't forever. And I want something else. And they're going to be looking to have more impact and do something. And I think many of them are going to, are striving towards self-employment. Yeah. Before we talk about some of the drawbacks, I want to actually get your take on the gig economy. Cause as you're saying that and you're, so when you said like, you know, the employment being high and that we're going to have more self-employed people, I, I immediately kind of like raised my eyebrow and thought about that because I think a lot of people are scared to take that jump. They don't know where to start. They don't know what to sell. And a lot of them will, to be self-employed, will get in through the gig economy. What's your take on what's going on with the gig economy as someone who's advocating for self-employed people? um, How do you think that that's affecting the landscape of being self-employed? Do you think that it's positive? Do you think it's negative? Do you think it's going to have repercussions for people who aren't in the gig economy, uh, kind of down the road, kind of more serious things? What's Mm -hmm. your take on it? I think, you know... I think there's, I think a lot of times it's a, it's a bridge, right? A lot of like, to your point, a lot of people will take on a, you know, some kind of a, a per gig thing uh, as a bridge to where they want to go. They're just trying to figure it out. And anything people need to do in their lives to figure themselves out, I'm all for, whether it's a sabbatical as you took, or somebody uses a gig type of job as uh, an interim to find themselves. I actually did some branding work with a trucking co- trucking company. Um, they reached out to me because they, they actually are having a problem recruiting drivers. I mean, like, it seems really unfashionable to be a truck driver nowadays. That's their, big, their biggest problem is they can't get drivers and they have trucks sitting still. And I looked at the recruiting practice and I said, well, the problem is your messaging of your recruiting practices are, so, are totally wrong. Most people are not looking at being a truck driver as a career move nowadays. I said, your primary market to me are the probably 25 to 30 year olds who went to college, got an education in a certain degree, got out, tried it for a year or two and found that they hate what they're majored in and they need some time to find themselves. You know, so I asked the company, I said, what is the minimum length of employment that's worth the training program to get a driver on the road? They said six months. I said, you need to promote this as like a one year experience for somebody who's trying to find themselves. What better way to find yourself than driving across the country repeatedly for a year, right? It totally shifted their recruiting because they were still recruiting truck driving as a career move. It's not for most people. So I am all in support of what it takes for somebody to find their way to their next thing. And often that is a gig experience where I would caution against, you know, we're talking before about different terminology, actually, again, devote a whole section of the book to the different terminology, like the difference between the downfalls and, 
advantages, but I'll say mainly downfalls of referring to ourselves as a small business or an entrepreneur or a freelancer. And I look at freelancers kind of this gig economy, if people call them freelancers. You know, at the end of the day, why not just call, call yourself a self-employed whatever? Like if you're a freelance designer, you know, what, what that tells people is you might be an awesome designer, but if you're a freelance designer, it doesn't resonate with a business model. It doesn't seem like you have a business around it. It mm-hmm. sounds very gig oriented. Why not call yourself, when, when you take it serious, then you're a self-employed designer, right? That means there's a business model behind it. Yeah. Um, same thing with solopreneur. It's like, I get it. A lot of us are businesses of one, but I think it diminishes what you're capable of because nobody achieves big levels of success alone. You're not, we don't want you to be solo. That's why my whole thing is about community. I don't want you to be solo. I say all the time, I end every podcast by saying you might be in business for yourself, but you're not in business by yourself, right? There's a group, a community of people that's, I want to bring together this community so we can support one another. Um, so I'm okay. I'm, I think, you know, the, Hey, the reality is I think it was in the last I got any stats on this really was kind of 2008 returns because 2019 returns got very funky because of 2020. But I think it was in 2008, 30, there were 57 million quote unquote self-employed people, 30 million of them filed a schedule C Mm -hmm. and the other 27 or thousand or 27 million or so are what are considered members of the gig economy. So it's a huge economic pool. Um, And if it gives you, I'll give you another spin on that. I actually had a client, uh, gentleman reached out to me. He was 55 at the time and he had built and sold numerous companies, very successful guy. And he had just left the most previous business he built and which he was in for 15 years, left it at 55 years old, reaches out to me for some coaching support. Cause he has no idea what, where he wants to go next. And to, quite honestly, he doesn't really need to, but he reached out to me. And it's one of the first things he said is I'm not dead yet. And I totally got that. You know, he's 55 years old. I, I'm just uh, at that time, I was a couple years younger and um, I totally got it. He was just feeling, I'm not dead yet. But he also is clear. Like, I don't want to go back to the grind of what I did. So what we did is I created a whole brand and business model. Basically, he's a, I call him a timeshare C-suite executive. Basically, what he knew is he, he didn't, he had an amazing skill set. He, because he's built so many businesses, he's a CEO, a CMO, CFO, COO. He's got all the credentials. And, but he knew he didn't, he didn't want to take on a long-term gig. He didn't want to become a CEO of another company. He didn't, he wanted more freedom in his life. So basically he's a gig worker in a way. He is a timeshare C-suite executive. So if companies that are in between CEOs, he can fill in for three months or four months until they find the next CEO. If a company is trying to get their finances in place, he's a, he can take on a six month contract as a CFO. He rarely will take a position for more than six months. He wants to live on a gig basis, but it's not what we think of. This is obviously a big investment stuff. This isn't what we think. We're not thinking Uber driver, Yeah, but it's still a gig, a gig position. You could say it's on a per gig basis. Yeah. And I think really what you're speaking to about what's appealing to people is, and I think what has been exacerbated or illuminated by the, the pandemic is that your life doesn't have to be this prescribed. I go to work at eight and leave at six and it's, you know, it's five days a week and this and that. And like, you know, uh, there's one parent at home, one working and 2.5 children and a white picket fence in the garage. Like life doesn't really work that way. And what we're seeing from this pandemic, I think, I can't remember who said this, but put it very brilliantly that it used to be that we had to find a way to fit our personal life around our work. Mm -hmm. And nowadays we have to find a way to fit our work around our personal life. Like you, you commented before we went live that like got all my baby stuff in the background. Like this is my office right now. It's in the corner of my living room. I got my whole setup, but like behind me is baby playroom. Um, And, you know, you see that people, you know, they come in and some people you see that they have a chandelier and other people you see that they're like, they got a tapestry hanging from their wall. And like, you know, it's, it's totally different environments and everybody's got to try and figure out what they're doing. Some people have kids on calls. And I think the the whole move to self-employment, I think you're right. People are feeling a yearning of like, I want to have more control and more freedom to decide how I spend my time. Yeah. And that's really the, the essence of the book. And I love that you just said that is that, I mean, I literally start the book off by saying, uh, you're asking a question that I've asked countless self-employed business owners. I've said, well, why did you become self-employed? Everybody has the same answer. It's some version of control. I wanted to control my future. I want to control my destiny. I want to control the hours I worked to which we've then both chuckle, chuckle because we realize it's anything but control. Like you go into business for yourself to control your future, but you're joint, you're entering uncontrollable circumstances. Mm-hmm. And that's what I've done with this book because my observation after 36 years in business was like, yes. And 
you actually can have a lot more control of the outcomes of your business than you may currently realize. Because if you just buy into it being, you know, if you go into business for yourself to gain control, if you buy into the uncontrollable circumstances, um, then, then you're letting go of your hope for control. What you can do, which is what I wanted to lay out in a very specific way is what I call the self-employed ecosystem is the essential elements, the pieces that when in place, what you've really accomplished is that you have created the environment for the results you want. Because I, Jeff, at the end of the day, we're, none of us are, we're not in control of anything. We're not in control of any outcome. The best you could do in life is to create the environment for what you want to have happen and then sit back and allow it to happen. The reality is 99% of the time, what you set up to happen is going to happen. And that's the cool thing. That's, you know, I left poop on the chicken eggs. I was creating the environment for a feeling that I wanted them to have. And I got that feeling from them, which inspired them to keep buying. So I'm all over. And I didn't realize, to be honest with you, Jeff, I didn't, since you're a fan of Lingo, I did not get the connection between this book and Lingo. I actually had to reach out to my editor of Lingo and share my outline with her and say, I don't want to be one of those authors that puts out books that don't, aren't connected. And she sent me a video back and she goes, are you freaking kidding me? How are you not seeing this? I'm like, what's the connection? She said, what you help people do is to create the environment for the results you want. In Lingo, you're teaching people the, env the environment of brand messaging to attract the ideal customers they want. In this book, you're going broader and teaching them the environment to set up their, their self-employed business to get the results they want, the life they want. I couldn't, I initially couldn't see it. Now, of course, I can't not see it. <laughs> Yeah, of course. And actually, just the way you spelled that out now, I don't think I'll be able to not see that. <laughs> exactly. um, and then I started off by asking you the question, because I really felt like, you know, you just wrote a book on lingo. Like if you were to just sit down and go, okay, well, what's the lingo that I can easily talk about without any preparation? Like sort of like what I guess the, the TEDx, uh, or not the TEDx, the, the presentation that you gave the keynote where you tried to do the different thing that kind of like opened this door. It was just kind of like born out of passion. Like what's the thing you could talk about? And I thought that that was why it became your thing because you already know this lingo. Like you didn't, you, you barely had to do anything additional other than go deeper into something that you already are passionate about and love and is your community. Um, you made an interesting point about control. I wrote a blog post a while back called Control Influence uh, Accept. And I think what, what you've illuminated is that I think a lot of self-employed people think they have control when really what they really have is just more influence. They have more influence over how they spend their time. They have more influence over when they work. They have more influence on the type of work that they do. Whereas I feel like when you are working for other people, sometimes you have less influence and there's more things you have to accept. And in the self-employed life, I, I feel like there's less that you have to accept because ultimately it's your decision whether or not you even keep going. Yeah. You know, it's, there's just in the same way, there's a fine line between uh, good marketing and manipulation, yeah. you could say, right? I mean, it's a fine line. A lot of it, what, what defines it often is your intention behind it. But here's what, here's actually having said that, here's what really defines it is what it does for the person, right? So there's a way in which you can, you, know, you as a business person can control something in a way that it makes somebody feel manipulated or you can do something in a way that makes somebody feel like you, you care for them, right? You could look at how do people feel about uh, tracking pixels and cookies and such. Um, I appreciate curation. I really appreciate when I buy one thing, I start seeing similar things on my Facebook wall. Like I actually appreciate that. Um, I appreciate Amazon saying, if you like this, you might like that because I'm a busy guy. I like people curating things. Can it, can it get manipulative, annoying? Absolutely. So some people are going to look at that as manipulation. Some people are going to look at it as an act of service. And it depends on the intent and it depends on the result and who you're speaking to. The One of the stories I tell in the book, I think that demonstrates this really well is how I ended up in Miami, where I, I live now. I moved here a little more than five years ago from Manhattan. And I came down for three months you know, in the back of my mind thinking I could move there. I knew the area well enough, having spent some time here. I liked it, but I'm such a New Yorker at heart. I didn't know if I would actually ever leave New York City. Um, but I came down here for three months and towards the end of that, that stay, I, you know, I hadn't really found anything that resonated for me. I had a good time, but I didn't find a place I wanted to live. But in the three months of being into a lot of people kept telling me, go check out this place called South of Fifth. South of Fifth. South of Fifth is there. It's the five blocks south of Fifth Street on Miami Beach. 
Miami beach is a huge tourist town, a lot of partying. It's just not my jam. So I had no interest. I kept saying, I'm not going to live in Miami beach. So I went to this neighborhood. I wasn't there five minutes and I fell completely in love and knew this is where I wanted to live. Like I, I just, I went to this area, these five blocks, this is the most gorgeous park on the ocean with meandering paved paths, a restaurant, beautiful apartment buildings. And instantly in love within two days, I found an apartment, signed a lease, drove my massive, ridiculously sized SUV over to the local dealership and traded it in for a Mini Cooper. Within two days, called my kids and said, I'm not coming home. They're like, what the, you know, what the heck, dad? <laughs> you know, couldn't believe it. I'm like, no, I, I, I have fallen. Well, here's the deal. Shortly thereafter, I go to a new accountant because you need a new accountant. I'm in a new state and I'm moving my business here. And they, I, I would jokingly somewhat said to the account, well, so much for saving money. My rent was the same at the apartment I chose as it was in Manhattan, which is not cheap. The difference was it was bigger. It was on the beach, but I didn't save any money. And I thought, as a lot of people thought, moving to Florida was going to save me boatloads of money. And he said to me, well, you do know you chose the area that was designed to attract New Yorkers. I said, what do you mean it was designed to attract New Yorkers? Because did you not notice the park looks exactly like Battery Park in Manhattan? I'm like, oh my God, it really does. It's my favorite place in New York City. And he goes, did you not notice the Smith and Walensky in the park, which is like a Manhattan iconic steakhouse? I'm like, oh my God, you're right. And he goes, yeah, wait till you live there. They're all New Yorkers. And so now you can look at that one of two ways. Was it on the designers, the the build, the, the uh, developers of that neighborhood knew exactly what they were doing. Apparently, that was their goal. They knew exactly what they were doing because they could get people like me coming from New York City who are already used to paying an astronomical amount for rent. That we're just gonna we're okay for paying the same amount, stupidly, right? So it was you could look at that one of two ways. Was it manipulation, or was, I saw it as a favor. I saw it as developers deciding to get to know who they wanted to attract so much that they did the right thing and put everything in the right place that they never had to sell me on anything. There wasn't even a realtor there. I sold myself. And that's the control we have in business. That's the control we have today is create the environment for the results you want, whether it's brand messaging or the construct of your business, everything being in place. You almost don't have to do anything. You're attracting your ideal customers. You're getting the results you want. And it's easier. I love it. I think about this conversation all the time, the influence, manipulation, persuasion conversation. Because I read, I've read a lot of books on the subject already, and I continually am fascinated by how to shape human interactions. And there's this point at which when you have read enough about it and you learn enough about it, it's almost like what I, what I say is like, you can see the matrix, like you can see power dynamics unfolding. You can see how different uses of language make people feel different ways. And I think about that a lot because I think when you get really good at it, when it becomes second nature, are you manipulating people on a regular basis? And I think the other lens that um, I appreciate that you bring it up in a, in a positive light because I, I tend to go down the very negative light. You know, having worked in social media for, uh, you know, 10 years, I basically saw all of the manipulation happening at every possible level and purely not for our benefit. Um, you know, we did benefit in some ways, but it was not the point. So I appreciate you, you bringing that lens to it because I often wonder where that, where that line is. And I appreciate that, that in lingo, what you've done and, and what it sounds like you're, you're doing in the employee, the self-employed life is you're, you're trying to hold up an ideal of something that is, that is good. Like here is what we can use this for in a really positive way and almost challenging people to continually use that as their sort of like North star for it. Like, you know, you could use these powers for evil to the point of like where you live in Miami, like, you know, they could have price gouged. They could have, you know, charged more than they did in New York and they could have, you know, pandered to you and done, you know, they could have been like, Oh, we put in a Sparrows, right? Because that's what New Yorkers want when they want pizza. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, they could have done all of those things, but Maybe they chose not to, or, or your experience of it is that it's a value add. It's not manipulation. It's not taking you for a ride. Correct. Yeah. Like I said, a lot of it is the basis of your intent. And I like to believe maybe perhaps naively that most people's intent is good, you know, and I, I that's, I certainly encourage people to, to go into because, and content, you know, it's um, similarly, I actually wrote a article for Huffington Post many, many years ago. Uh, title was something like, are you showing up salesy or committed? right? It's just a different energy. You yeah. know, I mean, you can, 
it's, it's, it's different intent. You know, if you should, you can show up at the end at the moment, especially nowadays, you show up in an energy of salesy, people are going to back up. They want nothing to do with you, but you could be so committed to someone's well being that it is actually amazing how bold you can be, but your energy is so clean and your intent is so clear that you can get away. I mean, there are people I have met that I am so excited about what they're doing. I won't let them not hire me. I'm like, you have got to hire me to, to help you with this. Like what you have created is so amazing. It's killing me that your website messaging is so bad that nobody's getting the right idea. You know, and, and actually one of my clients, her name is Patricia. She created disposable underwear for women. Okay, but here's the kick. They're like sexy thongs and bamboo. The funny thing is I joke about her all the time. It's like, who would have ever thought I would end up being like the biggest advocate for women's disposable underwear? But I loved what she was on to. Like, this is not disposable underwear for incontinence. This is, it's made of bamboo. She's a, a, a black woman. So there again, she was important to her to make this out of bamboo because of the negative history of cotton in her culture, mm -hmm. right? So she didn't want to use cotton. She used bamboo to make this disposable underwear. They're sexy bikinis and thongs. They're for, as I, as in our brand messaging, as we developed, um, they're for when women don't want to ruin the good stuff. They're for women when they're on their period or they go to the spa or they go for a spray tan you know, and that you can who get just like two bucks a pair. Who cares if you spray right over it? Mm -hmm. It's for when women go to the spots, for when women go camping. Like, who wants to ruin the good stuff? And I, what she was onto is so brilliant. And it came from such a passionate place from her because she, she grew up in Uganda. Um, and they, um, she was, you know, living in the slums due to her father being murdered. I mean, it's a dramatic story. Mm -hmm. And she saw the risk of how many girls in third world countries don't go to school and get an education because they don't know how to handle that time of the month, right? So a portion of her proceeds goes back. So what she's doing is mission-based and beautiful. And her website messaging was horrible. And she's a startup and she doesn't have any money. And I, I, she had to hire me and she did, and she's killing it. And that's what I mean. Like the, the intent whether you are manipulating or helping somebody, whether you are being salesy or committed, all comes back to what's your intent. And from that intent and how authentic and sincere, and it has to be clean. You can't fake intent. Yeah. You can't. <laughs> you know, our BS meters are, are off the charts and we, we often don't give it enough credit. Yeah. And that's what I love about today's consumers. You know, you were saying earlier about, um, you know, the, some of the shifts in the world. I'm like, you know, a, a, Every time there's a crisis, and I've been through a few of them in my many years in business, that it just speeds up what was coming anyway. It really does. I mean, the, the remote workforce, everything we're seeing now was going to come along anyway. And one of the big changes, not just to this crisis, just evolution. Like, when I was just starting on a business, the rule of thumb in marketing, and you might, you might remember this, although you're a lot younger than I am, but they used to tell you to market to the intelligence level of a five-year-old. Like You had to make things so clear and obvious that a five-year-old would understand it. It is so the opposite way. I've got three kids. Like they're the most sophisticated shoppers. Their BS meter is off the chart. So we have to recognize as businesses, we are dealing with incredibly sophisticated consumers. I think often smarter than the business owner because we've gotten dumb to our own existence because it's, it becomes rote to us. We almost, we don't see ourselves, mm -hmm. but the consumers are they're so on alert. They're so on alert that we need to stay sharp, smart, and on top of it at all times. It's funny how complex it is to do something simple. Um, and like to, to think about this vast consumer body that you might want to appeal to and how difficult it is to actually say something authentic and meaningful and at the same time simple enough, not as not simplistic, but simple for the sake of being you know, getting out of its own way and not confusing. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm always struck by the challenge of doing that working in brand, how oftentimes the thing that most needs to be said is something very straightforward and simple, but it has to be grounded and rooted in a deep purpose, a reason for being so that that shows up, not just in that one sentence that you're writing there, but in, in the subsequent ones that come after that and after that. So I think that's a, it's a super important point. Um, we have probably about five ish minutes left, maybe seven. And I have like so many questions that I had prepared to talk to you about. Like I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but I also want to be respectful of your time. I know you have a hard stop. Um, so I had a couple things that were on my list and I, I figure I'll give you the chance to kind of pick from them what you want to talk about. But um, there's a couple things that 
you know, you had mentioned in some of your materials that I found about kind of what comes out of this self-employed life movement out of the book itself. So I figured we'll spend some time talking about one of these four. So there's, you talked a bit about the self-employed ecosystem and a holistic approach to business for small business. Talked a bit about that, but I don't know if there's anything you must want to elaborate. You've got personal development strategies to increase your capacity for success. So I think that might be a really interesting place for us to go. You've got the, uh, the relationally based business, uh, the hug marketing and the emotional journey. I don't know if you want to give away that secret sauce, uh, but if you do, I'm happy to go there. And then also the business model of multiples. So these are all things I gleaned from some of the materials that you've got, and I thought would be interesting paths to go down. But we we have spent so much time waxing poetic about all the different things of self-employed that uh, we didn't get to those yet. Where do you want to take the last few minutes to kind of drop whatever additional value, pique people's interest in the book, the community, and kind of help them to determine whether or not the lingo is resonating mm-hmm. with them to be part of your movement? Well, to me, they, they connect together. So I could probably bring them together relatively quickly. Oh, so the, nice. the, the idea of an ecosystem is just that, you know, ad- ad- adapting it to an ecosystem in nature um, that, you know, an ecosystem in nature, if any one element is off, it can kill the whole thing, you know? Um, and we've not looked at self-employment as an ecosystem. Uh, we, we tend to focus on the business strategies. The problem with that is if you keep applying more strategy, you're applying more work, but you haven't you haven't broken down barriers that are keeping you from just running and running on the wheel, but not, you know, working really hard or hardly getting anywhere. The cycle of breaking that is the personal development. That's why the triad, the the self-employed ecosystem is personal development, business strategies, and habits and mindsets to sustain you. Okay. So if you look at it as a triad in the middle, the media section of the book are business strategies for which I lay out very specific strategies that work, hug marketing, the business model of multiples, emotional journey. Those are very specific strategies that work really hard. And the problem is if you just apply what's in the middle, you're just piling more on, okay? What you also need is the personal development wing, right? And what happens in the the way I approach personal development, the goal is to increase capacity. And the goal is to increase capacity within yourself and for the results in your business that you want. You simply, you know, you have to, I look at it as a series of ceilings, right? You have to unblock your own mindset, your limited beliefs. And I don't mean that just in a woo-woo way, but I mean, we just get stuck on our own thought patterns and wonder why we keep getting the same results, right? So you have to break out of some blocks to raise the ceiling. Every time you raise the ceiling of your own personal, your skill set, your willingness to receive, how big you're thinking, all these things are, are raising the ceiling. Whenever you raise the ceiling, that which you want will come up to meet it. It's a reservoir. And when you've maxed out again, you've hit the ceiling, you just grow further. You expand further, creating more capacity. And the next thing you know, and it, it, it not only works on the inside of you, it works in the systems of your business. The problem with a lot of businesses is they have systems in place for the business they currently are dealing with. What you really need are systems that have more capacity than your current level of business. So your business has something to grow into. Otherwise you're just stopping it at where it is. And then the other piece of the triad are the mindsets and daily practices that you need, because how do you stand, how do you stay consistent with it? You know, before I even wrote the outline of the book, somebody asked me, I just had a concept and said, somebody said, well, what's the book going to be about? And they said, it's about giving self-employed business owners control over their business and skills to manage what they can't control. (laughs) <laughs> right. So I believe there's absolutely strategies that we can apply that give us that set up the environment to take control of the results we want to a f- much higher degree than we currently experience. And we also need mindsets and practices to sustain us because it is inevitably an out of control situation with a bunch of ups and downs, but how do we not get derailed because the long game wins. Okay. So, you know, that's the sense of the, that's what I mean by capacity, the environment, um, and those specifics. Hug marketing is just turning mar- marketing funnel upside down. It's not, again, intent, energy. The energy of a marketing funnel is terrible. It means we're going to scoop people up at a, at a broad opening and we're going to squeeze them through a hole in the bottom. Where if you look at it as hug marketing is a series of concentric circles, what do I have to do? to get people to step one step closer from outer circles, what I call lurkers. What do I have to do in my business 
both energetically and strategically lead magnets. And, you know, what do I need to do to take lurkers, people that follow me on social media that I don't even know them by name yet? What do I need to do to get them to take one step further in to becoming curious, right? When they start following me on social media, what do I need to do to take the curious to being engaged? What do I have to, what value do I have to provide to get them to actually now respond to me, connect with me, communicate with me, comment on posts? What do I have to do to then get them to connect meaning they've opted into your email list, right? Once they've connected, what do I then need to do to turn that, to convert them into customers? And once they become customers, what do I need to do to be hug worthy so that they become repeat customers and my strongest advocates? So to me, the energy of looking at it as a series of concentric circles puts the onus, the responsibility on the business owner. What do I need to do to bring somebody from the outer rings of the universe to a hug? So it's no longer about what they have to do at the end of the day, Jeff, I think one of the best things you can, we just need to stop making excuses in business. I mean, I said on a podcast recently, and suddenly everybody was quoting on a social media that don't let your circumstances become your because. Oh, I can't do well because the economy's down. Oh, I can't do well because there's a pandemic. Oh, don't let circumstances become your because. Because then you're doomed. Just do something about it. There's always something you can do about it. I mean, you can... These are tough times for people, but I am convinced, and this is what I help people every day with, is like, right now, we're in challenging times, but what's the winning side? Because for every losing side, there's a winning side. You know, being a photographer, working with the richest people in the country, they were the ones that were tanked in the Great Recession. Do you know who, you know what the winning side for me was? Bankruptcy attorneys. All my Wall Street clients were tanked. They weren't spending any money anymore. I fortunately had a pool of clients that were bankruptcy attorneys and investors who invested in short-term, very high interest loans to get rich people through their short-term losses. And they were making boatloads and thankfully hiring me as a photographer and giving me a fair share of those boatloads. You just have to look for what's in your business, probably what's in your business right now that's the winning side of the challenge. It's always there. Just don't let your circumstances become your because. Look for how you can get yourself out of it. I love it. It's brilliant. I love talking to you. Um, I absolutely love what you're bringing to the world right now. So much of it, interestingly, is like so aligned with what I'm doing with the Superhero Institute. Um, you know, the superhuman framework is very much about unlimiting people's potential. And there's a, you know, there's a process to it and a number of steps. And, and I loved your analogy of the reservoir. So, um, Jeffrey, thank you for coming onto Shareable. I think you were a phenomenal guest. Uh, as you know, second time here, uh, tell people where they can go and learn more about you, where they can pre-order the book, which I would encourage anybody self-employed to do. Jeffrey is the real deal. So please, please go pick up a copy. Um, where can they get all of the different information and connection to you? Yeah. So um, one thing I'm finding is really helped people. I've put together a bundle of the graphics. So there's a graphic of hug marketing. So, cause po- the thing with challenge with podcasting is it's audible um, audio. So you need to see it. So you can go to um, selfemployedbundle.com and get the graphics that are inside the book, the hug marketing graphic, the step up, step down business model. I even have a guide in there about how to be an awesome podcast guest because I'm so fed up with terrible pitches and bad guests on my own show. (laughs) So, but hey, let's face it. That's the way a lot of self-employed people market themselves. And it's a great strategy. Just just do it right. I want to raise the bar. So I've put it all together in a bundle. So self-employed bundle. And because you know what? You grab that, we're going to get to know each other. It's it's better there. As far as getting the book, I encourage people to go to the selfemployedlife.me. So it's the selfemployedlife.me. Um, you, obviously, you can find it on all the obvious retailers. But what I like about directing people there is we have the book uh, available for pre-order at nine online retailers. And that's important to me because you do not have to give your money only to the big behemoth. There are smaller online retailers that support indie bookstores that you can buy, buy the book through um, because I wanted to walk my talk. So yeah. that's... Um, you know, great. They're probably the best place. And for anybody who pre-orders the book, by the way, prior to April 12th, I've pulled together a, a, um, a two day summit and Jeff, you don't even know about this yet. Cause I haven't really put it out there publicly, but April 12th and 13th, I've put together a two day summit. Many of the speakers are friends of ours, 10 speakers. That's going to blow your socks off. Like it's unbelievable content admission to the summit is pre-order of the book, 1795 you have two days of content with some of the highest, 10 of the highest paid speakers in the world. Uh, the content is just going to blow people away and then change people, people's lives. And that's the goal. Count me in. I'm totally in. Um, well, 
thank you again for coming on. I know setting aside the time in your busy schedule can be tough, but I'm glad we made it work. I'm glad that I got to have you on here. I'm glad I got to pick your brain. I still have like 30 questions that I wanted to ask you, but we'll just have to um, talk after your waffle Sunday or something like that. There you go. Yeah. Well, um, excellent episode. Thanks for coming on. Episode was definitely shareable.